the 300 percent that you're seeing there. Um, that is primarily students that are attending outside organizations, other um, schools that are not classified as tuition or contractual expenditures for outside services that we need. Um, along with our regular contractual expenses that go up a part of that line. The other is the health insurance. You'll see a 10% overall increase in that. Um, we are budgeted for 12% increase in rate next year. That combined with the current rate, it uh, kind of evens out to a 10% increase. So again, a 0.39% increase in expenditures as well as revenue budget. So just to recap, uh, we did discuss this last week at our meeting, what's included in the budget. We're continuing all IB programs, the primary years, middle years, and diploma program. We are adding a DCT teacher at Clayton Healy, a social studies teacher at the high school, an English teacher at the high school, and we're going to continue the middle school sixth grade and chorus, which is an extra piece for uh, OSHA compliance, custodial review assistance in that area. We are adding security guard at Clayton Healy for our recess periods going to implement or looking to implement a scholarship at our high school level, as well as we're continuing to see security directly that are read and the reason for that and figure out what the best solutions are next year. Um, and we will have a plan set forth going forward as we begin um, our budget here in presentations and final budget presentations. Um, we have added a contingency student for students with special needs. Um, only one at this point in time for potential placement to BOCES, as well as continuing uh, Chromebook replacements through our BOCES lease program. All right, so, Karen, yes. when you spoke about the security director, can you just reiterate what you said? Agency had resigned from position, which is leaving us some savings within our budget. So, as a result of that, what we are doing as an administrative team is we looking at that position as well as looking at all administrative positions to determine what is the best use of that position, the use of that money. Um, for what does the district need as well. So we have money to do the budget that's allocated in the area of person. And due to the timeliness of the designation, it was not something that we were ready It was just before the last meeting, as you recall. And yes. so not in a position to really have a solid plan, but we do a fund for a little prior to after our plan in place. And that's the same. So these Chromebooks are replacing. What was that? Right. So we are through various sources of funding and with the prices, um, which the place begin, but we still have 25 other prices that we have to that we move forward with the budget cycle, we will have to replenish these continuously. So, yes, the plan would be if we're concerned with five, five to 12 uh, deployment and uh, you know, you know, considerable fewer four years, we deploy like that. So, fifth grade would be like five, six, seven, eight, and then nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And so, we could every year plan on. Replacement in those grades, and hopefully and you never get out the ones that are. At the and because we purchased so many single year, hopefully we don't get to a point where we have. Right. So you'll see on the agenda tonight is a um, lengthy disposal list right. of a lot of Chromebooks that are outdated, broken, you know, irreplaceable. Irre 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 I just wanted to have some elaboration. That's all. We're just looking to get to a, a much more um, consistent right. And that's the budget neutral every year is no the percent. We try to eliminate those spikes every three Correct. years. Yes, yes. The smoothing on expenses, of course. Smoothing it out every four years. We just accelerate from one to one because of the necessity to move to her. Similarly, the smart boards and things like that, looking at their life expectancy and trying to, again, yes. put a cycle of replacement in that makes sense. Thankfully, we have the system. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
the elementary at the DCT that's IEP driven right it's the second grade going to the third grade. So we're actually having an additional section in the third grade because it's just the amount of students that are getting that recommendation for the DCT. Here's a quick question. Yeah. The, um, I'm sorry, you guys done? Yeah. 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 Um, the compliance officer through those, is that also legal or once a month? You know? I believe it's once a week. Okay. They have all I know. And I've been, been talking with Kristen. It's a matter of staff who will pay for it. Yes. It's, I want to say it's once a week. Okay. But I have to double check that. Right. I spoke to Kristen a while ago on that one too. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so capital outlay projects we've been talking about this year. We started working on those and uh, successfully uh, almost completed this year's projects. It will be complete next week. Um, but they're one-year projects that get done within one anticipated le legislation to increase that to 250. However, when the final budget was released on Friday evening, it increased did not occur. Um, which was a little bit of disappointing news on our side. However, um, we are optimistic. I actually just met with Renew Contracting yesterday um, to work all the bathrooms with them, and they are working on a price sheet for me to get all those bathrooms still done within $100,000 uh, with a potential complete remodel to the one bathroom by the nurse's office and some upgrades to the female and male bathroom by the auditorium. Um, the complete remodel will have bathrooms that are down by the cafeteria as well as the most currently matched middle school. So our goal is to make them different in style. So Renew is working on that hopefully and they will be done. We have had Casey Broderick in already as a response issue. So we're yes. Okay. Yes. So um you know, based on my conversation yesterday with Renew, um, I was very pleased to hear this, them tell us that we should be able to get this done with $100,000. Great. So, those bathrooms are just the, the two that are the, the, are the main office. They're going to be a phase. They can give us what the cost we generally have. I believe he's going to give you both. Yeah. Um, and with regard to the floor, we had talk about, talked about just kind of um, talking over the over the current floor, however, he doesn't recommend that because it would cause a lip. It would cause a lip. It would be an issue. He said it would kind of better just to recognize it, and there's a lot of piles and such. So um, he is pricing that out. The stalls, he's also pricing that to totally. So we'll have. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll, you know. Yes. Yes. So uh, the proposed tax rate, currently it's an estimate. Please keep in mind that the board does not set the tax rate. The tax is set the rate, and that does not get set until about October, November, um, once the board sets the actual tax level. Uh, they projected this year the tax rate. We do this um, again, the town set those assessments. They are increasing and they have increased about 88,000 year over the year. So that's kind of the projection where you get these numbers. Um, so we've got a $104 increase on the average home in the average school, and that's an annual increase. The board meeting is a 47 $576,400, which is within our maximum levy limit of 2.427. That's it. Any questions? Thank you for valuing the test. To do as we move forward, we appreciate it. So, our next meeting is May 4th. Um, May 4th is the annual budget hearing, and then from that, um, Dr. Macera and I will try to schedule some other outside organizations to inform them of the budget. Great. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Motion to your budget workshop. Motion. Motion second. Second. All in favor? Yes. Motion carries.
Well, let's make an open that course. Yeah. And let them get started. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to call to order the public session. Do we have any order? Do the kids have projects they want to set up? Oh, okay. So we're going to set up. Five minutes set up and we'll be.
Okay, uh, call to order, public meeting. And this, uh, we're going to start right off with student recognition. All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, it's always great. Uh, you know, this this is uh, the second time, second meeting we, we've had the opportunity to be in here and invite our students in to make some presentations. Um, and I have to say, we have two presentations today um, from the school and the elementary school, I should say, we have here. Um, and one of them was sort of a planned presentation, and one kind of came because Dr. Meyer was so inspired by those monster projects, you could not, <laughs> you know, we had to put a spotlight on that as well. Um, but last week, um, we were really excited um, to be able to see some of the work that our middle school students are doing. Um, to really, you know, one of the things we love about the International Library Program and the MYT program is that um, it, as part of it, all students have to be able to be community project. Um, and that community project is something that helps to build our school community connection. Um, and our kids have come up with, you know, when you, you walk into the school, I was talking to the, the school earlier, um, a little bit about the feeling of walking into that middle school um, and how good it feels. And actually, I talked to Dr. Red about it. Um, you know, when you walk in and, and you see, you know, all those plants in the front lobby and you see the dishes and you see those beautiful pictures and, and um, the, um, even the, uh, the lost and found thing that one of the students made as a community service project um, or a, a MYP project. Um, it just really has such a great feel about it. And um, it really, it, it gets me excited when I'm walking in. Um, and so this opportunity to see the projects that the students have done to contribute to our own community I think are really super special. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Reggio and introduce our students. And yes, the um, softball team did win five points. <laughs> Straight from the athletic field to, to here to the great work of having the best of all. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. So, one of the things that I love about Senator Richards and strikes me about our students from such a young age as they enter middle school is just this culture of community and service and altruism that really is part of the age of Santa Marcia's and the IP community project. One of the things that we love so much about it is it aligns with what our students are already doing and really takes it to the next level. So I'm going to introduce, so as my name is George Husky, our eighth grade English teacher, is our IP coordinator, and Mr. Velati is our uh, project coordinator. So they really work together to spearhead this. And it actually dated back to last year when they met with the students as seventh graders. So it's been quite the journey, and we're really, really proud to be able to celebrate it. We had a dream um, pre COVID of being able to come up to a board of education meeting live with students and present their projects. We couldn't do it during the pandemic because this was all done virtually. So we are extra excited to be here tonight and be able to have that um, dream reality with this wonderful group of students. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Horchowski and Mr. Velotti, who will tell you a little bit about the process of the project. That we have a two minute video clip to show you about all the students' projects are pictured in the video from the whole industry. And then we have these wonderful students here that are going to tell you a little bit about each of their projects live. So that is um, our presentation with Sir Trusty and everybody. All right, thank you, Dr. Rachel. So, as we were saying, they, uh, this is a service based learning project that we introduced to them all the way back uh, in seventh grade last year. And then we really started it this October. We told them to pick something that they're passionate Made it so much of a difference for themselves if they picked something that I'm passionate. And then they had an open uh, window from December to basically last week when they had their community project uh, gallery walk, where they got, went into the community, they went to churches, they went to beaches, they did stuff for Ukraine, they built things for our school, and they did stuff that they had passion for. And that is the, the key to uh, what we had them do. Uh, they were able to do it by themselves, groups of two or three. What we're proud of them is that every single eighth grader student, from my self contained students all the way up to uh, students that are taking regions exams in two months, participated and did the project uh, and did it complete, complete, good. So that's what we are proud of. Um, and then Ms. Horchowski is just going to talk about the process. So, you know, uh, like you said, we started this actually like three years ago, but for real, we <laughs> were actually saying, like, why don't we do this next? I'm like, oh, I'm hoping, but. moment for us to actually be here with them and like you said we really trust the kids pick something that you love that you're passionate about we didn't tell them what to do and that was very scary for not only some students but also some parents they wanted a list they wanted a check 
here and this is what I do. But we really kind of put it on the kids to use the skills that they have learned throughout middle school, research skills, communication and collaboration skills, critical thinking skills, creative thinking skills. Some of these kids got so creative with the way they executed these projects um, that we're just blown away what they ended up with. Um, you know, they had to plan this out. They had to formulate, you know, what they were going to do, how they were going to do. They had to talk to adults in the community. Some kids, like, went to stores on Main Street and, asked, like, put their boxes and their collections there. So they have really real-world internal skills. And that's, you know, what we want them to do and be and, you know, go out to the community. And we, like I said, we had a gallon of products. We had small projects, big projects. But we, we said, like, every single kid participated, and whether it was a huge project or a small project, every project made an impact. Every little drop fills a bucket. So I think, you know, we're really, really proud of them and their efforts and the impact they're making on the community. There's a few people that we'd like to thank. Uh, we have to thank the parents. You're the ones that brought them to the places, the products, you go to the stores. We have to thank you guys. We also have to thank the mentors because each one of these groups has a mentor. So thank you to the teachers, to the admin, to the parents that uh, went up and beyond to be their mentors. And thank you kids for doing this because you guys exceeded all of our expectations. So thank you. So I'm going to show the video um, and then we're going to hear from each of our students. So Mr. Korotowski alluded to this. So one of the pieces that we didn't anticipate was leading up to the showcase, which happened um, live last week. All of these boards and presentations were done all outside of school. So that's just contrary to what we usually see at school. The teacher, you know, can usually see how the progress is going prior to the presentation um, and be, it's okay, be able to monitor and know what kind of what the students will end up with. So prior to the <laughs> showcase, um, this is for a lot of teachers and I were waiting for the morning up. What is it going to look like? Are they going to come in? Are their actual boards going to be? We're going to be the three of us in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so I have like release.
And we figured no better way to sell hot chocolate on a cold winter because we figured out in winter, we all know, people love hot chocolate. <laughs> they want to drink it, they want to drink a lot of it. So that's what we came up with the idea. Great. Everybody's thanking me. Everybody loves everything. So 
for bases, which basically we made a, a crate with JV baseball field to store gear, just gear, and anything baseball related in. Because um, the varsity field, they have um, like a crate they put all our gear in. So we did this to make it more. Let's use it. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Uh, 
Are the whole team's here. I'm Brody Mayer, and for my projects, I am a Tyler Sox, and I donated in my school. And for every character on Ross, there's also um, a pair of people who are a team to lead. And we sold uh, 50 socks, and 30 were donated to helping to happy, and 20 were donated to local fortunes. So the whole point of our project was to raise money to try to rebuild uh, our school basketball values for rec and all that. So now we go outside for during lunchtime, we usually go out there and play basketball with me and Blake. Have both grown up, grown up with our sport, really. So it's kind of something that we both love to do. We figured that got to be a great way to kind of help the community. Uh, so what we fixed it was we got white paint and we got black paint. So we, uh, it took like around an hour and a half to do that. And <laughs> <laughs> we did fundraising to the body products by the big sale, which we did at a school with a class class, selling sugar cookies, chocolate cookies, and breakfast. Nice. Projects kind of um, brought a variety here to show you how much they stand really together. They can raise awareness to a topic, to raise money for a cause, or building something. So the students really have to pick what was near and dear to their heart. So let's give them another round of applause. speak with such modesty about what you've done for the community and for other people outside here is just unbelievable and would love i know we can't do it monthly yeah. it's a lot of work um, and it's a lot of hate. yeah and a lot of work for you um, our needs are so bright so if you got i can't even tell you how wonderful it is to see your faces and the pride on your face when you're standing up here you learned a valuable lesson self food you can raise a lot of money. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming tonight. It was absolutely awesome. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Thank you. As we transition, I would just say that, um, you know, continuing part of, of what I would have talked about, um, Dr. Meyer and I got into every single grade level, we did grade level assemblies for every single class from sixth grade through twelfth grade. Um, over the past three days, we, we called it the, the pair room. Um, and what we do there, talking with whole classes, so, you know, 120 kids per group, about um, things around mental health wellness and making sure the kids are aware of the, the kinds of social emotional learning supports things we're trying to do. And one of the things we talked about with, with our kids was that, you know what, this is a pretty special place. It's a special place because of the close community that we have here. Um, and we promote that in so many different ways. I think a community project is something that does that. But I think the next project also shows another way in which we try to connect our kids to each other. So taking kids in our high school or middle, excuse me, middle school classes, in our facts class, and bringing them back, connecting them to elementary students is a way to really, uh, again, bring that small town connectedness. And, and so I want to give credit to um, the middle school for really taking a front, and the elementary school for collaborating on the project that I think is just one of the most adorable things that I've seen for education. So, Dr. Reggie, take it away. So, um, Mr. Folger, come on up. So, um, Mr. Folger came to me, yes. Mrs. Folger came to me and said, how about we last year, a year ago, with this dream and this idea. And she sat in my office and she explained the whole idea. And I said to her, I'm like, okay, you have know, full support. I love it. It sounds amazing. You think we could pull it off? <laughs> <laughs> they could do it because previous to this year, when it was the sewing unit, as many of you are older children know, students sew pillow, like a rectangle pillow, or like a little uh, stenciled animal that was standard, a pre-cut figure, and everyone did the same one. So she had this dream of unique, every 120 reality, and she said, yeah, that's right, don't worry. And she ran with it. So I want to turn it over to Mrs. Bulger. I'll be your clicker on the slide. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about your awesome idea. Okay, so um, my idea had two angles. So I first went to Ms. Richie, and we talked about it. And can we get some of the teachers involved? And then that's when I met this one. He said, yeah, to <laughs> Our teacher will help you. So I reached out to her last year and I said, What do you think? You know, it's crazy right now. It's in my head. And she was like, Absolutely. Yeah, so we'll, we'll brainstorm. So the two things I was looking at one, I wanted to bridge the gap, especially for kids with COVID. These younger kids that were thinking, they kind of miss out on some of that elementary school experience. And I wanted to get them from our middle school building back over to the UH just a little bit to kind of keep their toes in the water. So that was my first thought with this project. The other was teaching 11, 12 year olds to work hard on something, put everything into it, and then give it away. Not easy for a sixth grader to spend three weeks working using the skills they had and worked on, and then never see that thing again. And some of them were really upset with me. Like, <laughs> I'm giving this away, and I was like, I promise you. When you hand it, and there are some second graders here, when you hand it to these amazing freshman children, mm -hmm. that is going to melt away, mm -hmm. and you're going to wish you worked even harder mm -hmm. because it's not for you. They were like, mm, we'll see. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, every single sixth grader had that. Mm -hmm. They right came up that. to us, and they were like, I should have worked harder on this. I should have added more to this. I should. Can we go back? Can we spend more time next year? Make sure. What's the feedback for next year? Let's make it longer. We need to spend time with these people so we can talk with them, we can sit with them. It wasn't about school teachers. It wasn't about being in their building, which were the things that I thought of first. It was making these connections with these younger people and doing something for someone else. Mm -hmm. This is probably the first time in their lives that they independently did something mm -hmm. and gave it to someone else. So kudos to them. Mm -hmm. So I have some amazing students. If you guys want to come up, mm -hmm. So I have some duos. Um, it was obviously on school nights easier for me to have some sibling groups because I did our sibling requests for this project. So like even Danielle and Wyatt. Yes, thank you. Wyatt and Cassie. Um, our brothers.
refrigerator through a picture in our Clayton Hoover and Mrs. Homer, and yeah. it was a monster of their design. Yeah. Story. So this slide shows so this is where Bloomberg students drew some amazing monsters, and then my amazing sixth graders used their superb sewing skills to bring strong life. So this is us uh, in action. So you can see in these pictures, we're given this beautiful color drawing, and that's what they do from. They make and templates. They cut everything from felt. We use a mixture of uh, embroidery floss, thread, buttons, different embellishments to bring these guys. Uh, this is one class set. So this was on the day of the field. Our sixth graders over to Clayton Huey. They were so excited. They had a security escort flashing like a whole deal. They felt a million bucks. <laughs> so here we have the Moors. Beautiful. Okay, so you can see this is why it's drawing, and this Cassie did on her own. Not easy. This is her first time sewing, and I'm saying, I mean, can you look at that? Yeah, the, the detail was truly really amazing. amazing. Can we look at the next one? So here we have David and his sister Danielle, and you can see again, and they did bring their monster, so you can actually you want to hold this right, up. Hold them up. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Such a personality. And I will say, here you go, darling, that Mrs. Bloomberg did give them some templates to work from so that it would be a little bit easier for the teachers to work with. Um, okay, so when they were doing them, I kept sending them that saying, too much detail. Too much detail. <laughs> <laughs> no way that they're going to be able to draw eyelashes. <laughs> 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 I had three, there are three more second graders and sixth graders, so I did use, the, I picked the three most difficult, I took those and used the samples along the way as we were learning. Um, this is Julia and her brother again, here's one of the more things, which I have on first, stuffed, then sewn onto the other piece. Okay, so here so just some highlights again. There, I blew me away. Blew me away. She was so worried. <laughs> I'm not sure about the stitch. Should I use a blanket stitch or a running stitch on? And I was like, it's beautiful. Um, here's another one, another difficult one. And you can see, like, there's those shopping where you can send away and have a stuff that we, you know, online. This they did a professional work. Students, I had to file this. I mean, students, one student cried when they saw it. One student told their sixth grade partner, I just love you and gave him a big hug. <laughs> and their reactions were, yeah, precious. It was beautiful. It's another one. You might also mention that the sixth grade is some of the books to go with. Yes, and so stories and games like uh, for those of you that are not familiar with me, I always have things that are very multifaceted. Not all students love to draw, so all love to sew or cook. Right, so I try to make things there's something for everyone. So, I'm like, okay, well, what can we do on the down days when we need a break from sewing? So, I was like, let's do a book, let's, uh, let's illustrate a book, then we can write stories about it. If you don't feel comfortable writing because you don't have an idea, then maybe leave some of that blank for your child, your second grader, playing something about their story. Some monsters came with names, others didn't. So, we had to brainstorm names, and then we would work as a class, right? If there was a few times where kids didn't have ideas. Story. So we would we would do the story together. So we'd say, um, okay, your monster's going. We would yell it out. Where are they going? They're going to the pool. Okay, and what happens there? Oh, uh, they have they're afraid of the water. Okay, and then what happens? And so we help build stories together. So that's great. Um, and then on days when look at this so cute. Um, on the back of the book, they could write a little bit about the author, so they could write a little bit about themselves, who they were, things like that. I mean, they just did a phenomenal, a phenomenal job. They did. It really, really was amazing. So I have every student, I have a slideshow version, which of course I will send you word that has every single child in the slideshow um, showing off their work. Of course, I can chunk it down for tonight just so you could get like a taste, but they're all this good. I was going through them and being like, I can't choose. They're all amazing. Um, really, really, really well done. Anybody have questions for us? I have some amazing students. Would anyone like to say anything about the experience? How it made you feel? I know you want to say something. Go ahead. Be free. Be free. Peace, Robin.
all lovely, lovely people. What would you like to say? Exactly. Did you thank your brother? Were you so lucky? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. And just think when you are a sixth grader, you're going to still learn from another student. Well, that's the second grade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on! Just tell us what you thought. Was it easy? No. <laughs> Did you get up? Hold it up. Show Show the This is a very intricate one. Yeah. <laughs> this is borrowed from a friend. Come on, show us your picture. Oh, yes. Okay, so this was the one that she sewed. This was borrowed from a friend. So we have borrowed. Borrowed. And I will say, Cassie worked a long time on the book. Yeah, she I lost my proud. first version, and then I didn't start a book. <laughs> <laughs> and so you wrote two books? <laughs> and, and how many pages did Mrs. Bolger mean to do in the book? I don't know. Do you remember? David, how many? Twelve. Twelve, that's every page of that book. Right? So fill your book. Did I make you do the fronts and the backs of pages? No. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the experience. What do you think, David? Um, it was definitely hard. Um, but I did but I did enjoy it. I had a lot of fun. Thank you. <laughs> what about you guys? What did you think when you got your when you got your monsters? Were you surprised? Yeah. Yeah. Bigger, bigger question. Did you remember drawing that drawing? Yeah. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> that was our fear. Mrs. Bloomer, she was like, these students are starting to ask. Now they're not asking anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hmm. But you know, it's hard to fill, fit things in. How long, did time. How long did it take? For, for us, it took three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. We brought two classrooms. Yeah. All the kids were absent, and we had all of the three classes. Yeah. Three yeah. classes. Yeah. We spent about an hour at the school. We yeah. broke them up by class, and each student we called them up one by one, let them present the kind of on the school carpet. They got to look at each other, have that moment, got the picture taken, and then they found like a quiet corner in the classroom, and the sixth grader read the second grader the book that they both had. Yeah. Yeah. Or chatted about so, things. Yeah. Or chatted about life. Yeah. And they, yeah. It was a great, a great moment. Um, and for me, it was really amazing because we waited this long, so I was able to know my students and their skill level, um, so that I could really say, okay, and so I didn't just say, okay, this, this period two and three, you're getting this teacher. I went through it. So waiting that long was very I need to go through the pictures and say, okay, because I want to set my students up for success. It's a lot of suffering, it's a lot of cutting. Um, so for me, I had to go through those pictures and say, okay, and kind of assign, all right, this was good for that one, and then those students would say, okay, you want to have a challenge? <laughs> and they would be like, yes. So then I'd say, okay, let's find a different one for you. Um, so that was really great. Um, yeah, it was, it was really a great time. We can't wait to do it next year. Previous years, we've always done monsters, but the students have drunk the sixth graders in their own pictures. So never again do they do brother. Okay? Um, <laughs> we've got a marriage year. The second grade. In the beginning, I think they were a little like leery, and then once they saw well, it, kind of thought they were going to be like ish monsters with purple. Like, they, they were absolutely yeah. amazing. I kept sending them yeah. pictures, yeah. you know, right? But Even I think, yeah. uh, Reaver, and I think I sent you a few too, like, look what's happening, look what's happening, because I just so proud of them. Thank, Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you. Thank you. I just don't understand why I'm getting out of the Okay. So I, I think we're working to get the, uh, the night presentation up. Um, and this presentation will show online as well. Um, as you know, we have um, we have contacted the scope for our pre-K program, and we've had um, great success there. And we you know, certainly appreciate um, the efforts of our scope teachers and, and scope as an organization. Um, uh, we have a champ as a um, as an after before care program for many years now. Um, however, you know we, we are keeping the door open, and we're we're looking at um, some options. There is some our orders are in our orders. I think that. Um, perhaps some, you know, working with our general fund for um, daycare services, or, uh, for health care services, um, is not necessarily the best model. Um, and so, therefore, we're considering um, alternatives to that and scoping one of those alternatives. So, we've invited um, Mr. George Duffy, the executive director of Scope, and Mindy Gagliola, um, who runs their health um, care program, and give a presentation to a board of education about uh, what Scope can so, um, George, thank you so much for being here. We're going to turn over to you guys. How we go after this? True. You know, when you, <laughs> talk, <laughs> when you talk about the passion, and then the second group, uh, I was saying to George, my son uh, is actually an artist in California, and what they're doing right here is actually the college class. Draw something. And then the art piece. It's amazing. Amazing, amazing. It's been 16 years since I was at school for that. And it's kind of nice to be in a, in a room and see the kids uh, as part of me doing something, doing the work that they do. It's, it makes you realize why we do what we do and why we're all here. So it's, it's kind of refreshing to see. Although I hate to be. <laughs> um, thanks, Ron. Thanks for having us here. And thank you, Mr. Ford, for uh, having to come in and spend some time with you and tell you a little bit about the and what we do and what we do in college in particular. The, the Universal Pre-K Program, uh, we've been involved in for a while now. We're new again here. We were at here in San Francisco for a while and then, uh, we were out for a while and came back about a year ago. Yes. And, uh, it's been, uh, Everything I can see is going very well. I'm pleased to be able to offer that program to the children here in the district. And as it's expanding, we, we went from, just to give you an idea, a year ago, having 1,300 children in pre K uh, the scope program, uh, over 3,000 kids in the scope program in one year. We went from about 36 teachers to 139 teachers. Something that was a problem now. So we've been a great year of all private organization, for not for profit state board of regents to provide services to public school on not just Long Island in New York State, although most of what we do is here on Long Island. We provide a lot of other services. Child care is just one of the things we do, universal pre-K, of course. We run a lot of enrichment programs for kids. We do a lot of professional development programs for teachers and administrators. We run we uh, publish professional journals, and I can go on and on and on. Uh, across Long Island, we have about uh, 12, 1,300 employees. We have approximately 400 full time employees that work in school. Our main offices are in Smithtown, and we have offices in Clayas. Uh, we have a, we're governed by a board of directors composed of active state for uh, We volunteer with the time to assist us in the planning the program and the implementation of those programs. Uh, and we also have some follow up representatives on, on that. Uh, been in business since 1964, for over 50 years, and throughout that time, we've been offering 
the before and after care programs, uh, generally when we go into a district, we set them up in a elementary school. Once in a while, we put them in a middle school, not too often. Uh, the real reason for that is that we just don't have enough kids in the middle school to take them in a top care program. Sixth graders are a little, little bit on the young age, but the seventh and eighth graders, as you know, they get involved in all the activities that go on, the sports, the things that go on in school. Sixth graders, now they're in school with the big kids in the seventh and eighth grade, they don't want to go to top care. So they want to find other things to do. But once in a while in a school district, particularly a district like this, the size of this district, We'll get, a, we'll get a situation where uh, we'll have some sixth graders and parents want to attend the child care program, and they will, uh, if they walk, they'll walk across the street to the school, or they'll, the bus the bus will transport them to the school where we host the program. And although it's not run in middle school, they are able to attend the program uh, in the district. Um, they're usually held in the all-purpose room, but we also license the gym and the playground areas. And then we license some additional space. The reason we do that, all of our programs are licensed by the New York State uh, Office of Children and Family Services. We can't use a space in a school unless it's been licensed. It has to be approved by the state in order for us to use that home. So if we're if we license the all-purpose room in a school factory or whatever it might be, and then you have kind of an activity that takes place in your school, like you know, a science fair or whatever. That space for the Boy Scouts needed, or the Cub Scouts needed, or the basketball, local basketball teams needed. We can't use that space. We have to have another space in the school to take control of it. The space has to be exclusive to scope. We can't share it. In other words, I can't have a scope after care program in an all purpose room with the Boy Scouts. It has to be during the time scope is in it, it has to be exclusive to the scope. So we might take them into the library, or we might take them into a classroom. Or uh, came out of the playground or the gym. So they go in and they, they do all the work to license the space. They work with the state to make sure that the space is appropriate. Believe it or not, kids can come in and family services walks in and says, Well, that space you have to do is you have to just make some changes in it in order to use it for a child care program. My argument's always been when you get the girls they lost, and now you're coming around to change all. The changes can be very minor. It could be uh, you need uh, covers in your electrical outlets in the wall uh, so the kids can't, the young kids can't stick things in the outlets. It could be that you have to have covers on your garbage. If it's in a tap tree, you have to have a cover on the garbage can. You can't have an open garbage can. Uh, if you have stained tiles in the ceiling, that's no good. You've got to get the stained tiles out because they say there might be mold in the ceiling. So there's a lot of things that we have to go through in order to license that space for the district. The program is open to any children in the district, age or age. Okay, anybody wants to attend, uh, it's open to them. Enrollment is always on a first come, first serve basis. There's two things that restrict how many children we can put in the program. One is the number of staff members we have, and the other is the space you provide. If you give us a room, the number of children that we can put in that room is based on the square footage of the room. Practically 24 square feet, I believe, per child uh, can occupy that room. So, if you have uh, 30 children and that, that meets the capacity of that room, we have to license an additional space in order to put more children into the school, and we have to put them in that room. Um, if it's necessary, what we do, and it does happen, is we have to establish wait lists in order for children that are uh, they register, but we just don't have enough space, so we don't have enough staff. To, uh, to bring them into the program, so we put them on the wait list in the order in which they register. And then as soon as the space becomes open, or we can hire more staff, or we get another room, we bring them into the program. There's a lot of controls in our program. Uh, we have at scope, we have staff that monitor our programs. We have field supervisors, we have district managers, we have uh, a nurse, an RN, that goes around and visits all of our programs. Make sure that our health, we have to have a health care plan for children in our program. Can we show children have special needs? Um, she monitors all of that. We have at every program site, we have a director, an assistant director, and group leader. So somebody that's qualified to be in charge of that program, and there's a, a 
assistant to that director, and then group leaders for the children to monitor the children. We also employ a safety consultant that works with our staff and works with us as we work with the school district to make sure that we provide a safe environment for the children all the time. Uh, we also do ongoing going training. The state requires that anyone that works in a life and child care program has to receive ongoing professional development every year. And it's about 15 hours of time of professional development a year. SCOPE provides all that training to the staff uh, no cost to the staff, and it's uh, we have to maintain records of all that training and present those records to the state if requested. Uh, we also visited by the Office of Children's Human Services. They have representatives that go out and visit all our programs, and they check to make sure they check on how the first they check on is to make sure that we're following the state regulations and we're in compliance with all the state regulations, which, by the way, is not always an easy task because many of those state regulations are written for us. Uh, programs like Acadia Academy, which is a, a private site away from a school, and the regulations pertain to those programs or a mom and pop kind of programs that run out of home. Well, now you have a program in a school, and a lot of times it's like working like kind of did a square peg in a round hole. just doesn't work. So we work directly with the Office of Children and Family Services, we have a good relationship with them. Robin Bellard was a regional elected director here on Long Island. I have a, a very good relationship with, and we we're able to work with her and her staff in order to make sure that we can maintain the, the appropriate regulations for the uh, programs that we offer. But they also check, in addition to making sure we follow the regulations, we need to make sure we follow all regulations. We have all the protocol that we put in place to make sure we provide safety requirements for the kids. Our staff online service so that if any time a parent wants to provide us feedback on a program, they can go online and go to the SCOPE website. They can fill out or have a concern with the program or something and send us that feedback and it's almost instantaneous that we receive. We provide every scope except for the cell phone. So the director has a cell phone and cell phone is always there at the program. Parents can communicate with the director through can communicate with parents. If there's a message we need to on a cell phone during the day, the parents can call into the cell phone number and get that and retrieve that message. We also use, and it's probably a system, I don't know if you use Connected, you use Connected. Many school districts use Connected. We, we use that system also. Uh, we really do run a, a cooperative venture with the school district, so they communicate with us, we communicate with them, and we can get the information out to the parents uh, through cell phones, computers, home phones in matters of a few minutes. With regard to the staff that we hire, uh, all of our sc all scope staff have to meet at least the minimum requirements for uh, the Office of Children and Family Services here in New York State. So a director committee. The director needs 18 credits in elementary education or related field, an assistant, non credits. Easy until you go try to find people that have these qualifications. It's, it's also tough because the hours that they take, we're asking people to work from seven to nine or something like that in the morning. And then we're also asking them to work from 3 30 in the afternoon, from the afternoon until 6 30 at night. So to find people that are available to be able to do that is no easy task. We work with the school district and we try to hire people from within the school district. So I know you have your own program here now. You may have individuals that are working in that program and so we're chosen and, and provide this program. The first group of people we go to is people you have working in the program now. And if they have the qualifications and the interest, they can come and work for help and become part of our agents. Um, it's, it's where we go first. Then we go to other community groups here. And we have your staff from the community at large. It might be from your school district. You might have a paraprofessional in your school that want to work in an after care program. You might have uh, people from uh, the community in general, retirees. Uh, sometimes we get retired teachers that want to make a part time uh, salary and work a few hours a day, and they'll come work with us. Um, do you still um, work to support like high school kids? With, uh, yes, sir. 
members, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. We, we employ high school children uh, to work with uh, young people, not children, the, the young people. They have to be at least 16 years old. Okay, and we look to hire seniors. They can work for school and in addition to earning a salary, and they make the same salary as a group of leader uh, in addition to a salary, we offer scholarship opportunities. So based on the number of hours that they work for us, we provide scholarships to the children to go on to uh, post uh, secondary education programs, maybe college or trade programs or whatever they, they choose to go. And they can continue to make Continue to work for us even after they leave college. If they go locally, they can continue to work for us through their, uh, you know, when they have available time, and we're flexible with that because their schedule change semester to semester. This so we work with them and uh, keep them employed when they have a break during a, a college semester between semesters. They come. We guarantee they work for us that they can come and sell for us during that time. And again, even during that time, they can earn scholarship money. College. And scholarship money is paid directly to the college. It's a true scholarship. It's not. It's not taxed or anything. That they have a two thousand dollar scholarship and gets taxed. But not you can do anything with it. You only have, while they're in high school and then you can continue on into the college years. Um, so talking about that connection before that you had with your uh, sixth graders and their second graders when you see one of our high school starting to learn their sight words and things like that. And you have these high school students and they're heroes. And it's such a beautiful thing to, to witness. The only caveat about using high school students is that we can't leave them alone with children. We don't leave them alone with children. There always has to be an adult in the room with them as a supervisor. We don't want the high school students in that position. We don't want to put ourselves in that position. We went on it. Um, but the high school kids are great and they do a great job for us. It's really a, uh, a nice opportunity. It's really a nice opportunity for kids that might be interested in going into education. If they're taking it on education, and we encourage that. Um, all of our staff undergo an extended background check. It's not the same background check that staff undergo when they come to work in a school district where there's education law. With the scope, they're figured through the Department of Criminal Justice Services, and it, uh, they're cleared both criminally as well as through the uh, a, a child abuse maltreatment case. So we do that. In addition to that, we have a we conduct our own background check on the work for us. When you come to work for scope, we have to sign an affidavit. It goes to an agency who goes out and conducts a a complete criminal background check. They're actually retired FBI agents. That uh, if, if you've been doing things you shouldn't be doing, we'll know about it uh, before you come to work with us. Um, our staff is also trained. Before they begin working with students, we put them through some initial training, some orientation training. They have to be trained in first aid CPR and AED, administration and use of an AED. In addition to that, we encourage all of our staff to be trained in math. Math is the administration of education. So that if a child in the program needs a particular education administered, and usually it's heavy pen, Benadryl, or things like that. But we do get kids that have diabetes. We get kids that have seizure disorders. We get kids that have a multiple care. We don't keep the kids out of our program because they have special needs. We're not a special needs provider. And we do everything we can to include any child in the program that we can include. So that training is essential and we require that our staff go through it. Every program has at least one person to train in that, that training at all time. So something happens, that person's out get somebody else into that site, and if we can't get somebody into that site that's trained in the administration of education, then what we have to do is we have to reach out and to the parents and say, just want you to know, the person is out today. Do you actually have two people trained? Usually, the, the director and the assistant. Yeah, usually it's the director and the assistant. And we would pay, we pay group leaders additional hourly rate that will also be trained in the administration of education. Um, our ratio is always one to ten in staff. We 
never go above that. Okay? And we never have less than two staff members at a site. So if there's if there's uh, ten children in the site, if there's only ten children in that program, we have at least two people, a director and usually an assistant at that site. And we make we always maintain that ratio. As far as activities, it's planned activities, club days, craft days, it's theme, theme. Uh, Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that? I just want to give you a brief. Right now, we have um, 200 AM and PM programs across uh, Nassau and Suffolk County. We're at about 37 different school districts. And I'm just going to take you through a brief day. In the morning, the kids come in. We start when she at 7. They come in, they're sleepy. We're ready to get them energized for the day. Provide them with a uh, small breakfast snack. And sometimes we have children that did finish their homework, so they'll do their homework in our program. But we do actually have, um, uh, we might sing some songs, we'll have gym time, and then usually the start of the day. Um, in the afternoon, school dismissal bell rings, ding, they come to our program, wash their hands, have a sets of red, first, we provide the children with a snack. Healthy snack party. We've been working a very long time. Ago. We were serving black and white, you know, the little black and white chocolate cookies that we all love. Until someone came around saying, "This isn't healthy," and so we tried to uh, provide healthy snacks. Then we give 40 minutes of quiet time, which is usually considered more time. For the younger kids, it could be looking at a picture book, or we could be doing coloring activities, as well as we give the um, children opportunity to do their homework. Then we usually I go either outside on the playground or we go to the gym. There's motor skills of our staff. So you may have some, so they, they could be starting a talent show. We have some women that have a knitting club going in, and it's amazing seeing all of these children getting involved in all different activities. Then we always say we gauge our programs, and I will say that I started as a um, site director. And I will then a preschool teacher myself, and I worked in the public schools. We really judge our programs when parents come to pick up their children, and I says, "Come back later. <laughs> Just come back later." It's to us. We put, you know, we provide children for any of these activities. If we run a special program for the kids, we provide all the supplies and all the materials for the activities. Um, Mindy didn't talk about it, but we do we do enrichment activities in the program. We do STEAM activities. We try to relate it to the age-appropriate activities for the kids to involve themselves in. Uh, we have special presentations. We bring in outside present presenters. It might be a ornithologist, or it might be a we, we contract it with BOCES, and they bring in things like Star Lab, and we can do with that. And the kids get it kind of like an indoor. Uh, uh, star sky experience um, and then we, we encourage the kids to get involved in school activities and community activities they might write letters to veterans or they may uh, put together Hanukkah cards to send to a local nursing home or so I guess this is what the kids here are involved in with community activities we encourage the kids in our program to do the same thing. as well as going back to those high school clubs sometimes we just have the robotics the high school robotics uh, right. team come into our program or the course come in if they can, if they want to practice, or children that want to practice for their NISMA um, solo, they'll come and they'll practice with their kids. We have the best audience, the, the children in our program. Okay, uh, as I said before, our staff is trained in the first aid CPR and that training. Uh, in addition to that, the child becomes sick in a program, what we do is we separate the child from the group. And we contact parents. You have to remember most of our program school nurse is not there. There's no school administrator. You know, on April 6 30 at night in elementary school. So um, in many cases, our staff are the only people in the building with that spot. So we'll separate the child out, contact the parent emergency contact, and we maintain that information all at all times, and we'll we'll send the children home with the parent. Um, and we do, as I said, uh, administrative medications and uh, medication that need to be administered for the children. We follow the school calendar. When school's open, we're open. 
to a closed or closed. There are districts that from time to time ask us to run a program during the vacation period. We can do that if there are enough children willing to attend that program. Parents need that care, and and we have the staff that can do it. And the staff that can do that. So we will do that, and we have done that for many, in many districts. Um, in the event of inclement weather, you know, we call the school district. Please, school district closes too close. If it's a bad snow afternoon and the school district said, well, we're going to keep our kids in school for the day, but we want to close, we want to close the buildings at 4.30, they'll ask us to contact the parents and ask them to pick the kids up at 4.30 or by 4.30. We, we never leave a child on the net. It will move all we need to do with that child to go back. It's 10 o'clock at night. If a parent's coming a long distance and can't get there, we have to stay with that child. Um, we use Connect Ed, as I mentioned before, and we do we do encourage parents to discuss with the children options. You know what happens? What happens if you do go home and parents are home? You know, have a plan. Make sure that there's some options for the children in an emergency like that. Here's the bad news. Okay, mm -hmm. I know this is going to this is going to seem like it's a lot of money, but I'll explain it and. What we've gone into many districts that operate child care programs, similar to the center Ridge, if you're operating your own program, and they made a decision to not go with that program any longer to go with an agency like so. CA basically and other agencies that do this. The full time after school program is If they come both morning and uh, what is it? Where's it? Five five eight. Eight. Uh, where's it? Where's it? Five eighty uh, a month for that, and then we run a part time rate if it's kind of something I don't need it. They only need it a few days a month. We get cases where I've had cases where a teacher said, I don't need a job here. I don't need it any other time. That's one time. A month. Do I have to really pay these rates? Remember that ratio of one to ten? I have to be able to maintain that. I have to make sure that we can in that program, and I have to have to get staff for that number of children. So I have to set that on number. But we do work with the parents. Um, the only thing that adjusts these tuition rates is the utilization rate that the district charges. If the district charges us the utilization rate for the facility, rental fee. Because I have to pay that staff member to say whether or not the parent is um, I'm sorry, is that kind of a, a district we do through? Most of the districts, what they do is what we do as a cooperative effort at the school district and a service to the community. So uh, I don't know who you're trying to Curcio, Ingram Smith, and I know them all. Uh, they would probably say to you, you don't want a gift of service, you don't want to provide a gift of services to an agency like so. You can't give it to them free. So they most districts try us a very nominal fee. Some districts try us more, some districts try us less. I have one district that charges us one dollar a month. I have another district that charges us on for a pupil hunting kids and for every child we pay a certain fee. They try to keep it as low as they can so that that fee's not passed on to the parents. Right. And so we can work with the district and with your attorneys. I know the Garcios uh, firm, they work with them all the time um, and, you know, put together on that uh, to maintain a rate that's not crazy. So we do set up these budgets. We're assembling this now. If you have a second child on the program, it's a 20% discount. If you have a third child on the program, it's a 40% discount. And it's 60%. And it goes right down to zero if you, if you 
uh, regardless of whether it's shop here every day, every month, uh, the other programs that we go on. It's just a wonderful, uh, wonderful organization and proud of the Does anyone have any questions that we can answer? I did give you some handouts that uh, yeah. yes. I can share it and use if you need to distribute an ETA. That. What we do offer is if, uh, if the time comes to talk further, I'm certainly always available. I'm happy to come out and speak with ETA groups. Uh, parent, if you wanted to get parents, uh, parent organizations together and have them discuss it with me and do a similar presentation. I'm happy to do that. We'll make it work for you if, if you uh, work for us. And just we can put this on our website. Well, the presentation. Generally, this is public, you know. Yep. Public meeting anyway. So it's anything about today, it's not a secret. Yeah, so we can direct that. Uh, people to it on the website. Absolutely. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, thank, thank you for coming out. Thank, thank you, George. Thank, thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've come to a board meeting like this anytime. <laughs> <laughs> it's very inspiring. <laughs> uh, on the way out for the live events, we just want to be able to uh, some swag bags for you guys on the way out tonight. We're going to make sure that you can get your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, that's your committee reports, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, we did have several committees. Say that um, we are clearly um, people are noticing some of the things we're doing. Um, in the recent onboard magazine, Dr. Soto um, was interviewed, and there was an article about the last book of Tennessee. And so, you know, I think that that's a, you know a credit to the work that's taking place in San Francisco and, and Dr. Soto in particular. So, Ricardo, thank you for that work. Um, and um, and I think it, it you know it puts it out there for the entire state to see that good things are happening in San Francisco and the. Uh, um, so really, really great stuff. Um, the um, no place for hate designation was discussed at that meeting, as well as um, um, you know um, talking about unifying messages, resources, and, and some future initiatives taking place within the uh, in the DEI committee. Um, there is also um, again speaking about what Dr. Soto is doing on May sixth. There's an equity champions um, uh, excuse me, DEI annual conference for BOCES. Um, and Dr. Soto is going to be a panelist there uh, about equity champions. Um, some of the nominations that we have, we have there. That, did you want to, did we have anybody that we have? I was going to be nominated. I think it's supposed to be a surprise. Okay, so we're going to leave it up. <laughs> so we are, we are having some people that are going to be nominated. We're going to be yes. identifying some people as equity champions. So that's that's coming. Um, but we look forward to you on Um, the Emergency Preparedness Committee met. Um, the lockdown drill was starting. Um, our normal lockdown drills are taking place. Remember, pre during COVID, we weren't able to gather and do modified drills. So we're back to doing normal drills. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but these things we have to do within our schools. So we are doing that. Um, but the uh, committee is um, taking a look, exploring some of the uh, idea of you know, capital bond and some make some recommendations for safety to the facility committee as well. So we've got. Um, some meetings take place there. Um, things work together. Um, also, looking at the scholarship, um, they're going to be presenting to that committee so that we can um, have a better understanding of how this uh, product will work and interplay with our current systems and other things that you know what we can get out of this um, student ID card system. Um, they're meeting again in May, May 24th. Um, we had our facility committee that um, each of the board members, I believe, all the board members at some point walked. Through um, individual um, appointments with uh, with Carrie and myself, um, as well as with the committee, um, to take a look at some of the things that we've been discussing, in particular the bathrooms um, and some fields. Um, so we we, uh, we did that. Um, the PC timeline is um, we're, we're ready to begin that project. We're looking forward uh, to the benefits that the uh, that project will bring to us. 
um, as well as looking at um, finishing up, wrapping up this year's capital housing project in the next month or so, um, and looking toward um, another hundred thousand dollars worth of work, hopefully on that in the coming year. Um, curriculum committee met. Um, as I said, um, Dr. Meyer and I did some presentations on uh, we called it the Pair Roadshow, and we did those presentations for grades six through twelve. But they were very well received. Um, individual students um, offered some thanks to Dr. Meyer, which you saw in the hallways, and, and myself. Um, so, really feel like um, that raised some awareness for the why behind SEO. Um, and I think kids walked away um, feeling like um, the district is moving in the right direction with regard to social and what we're trying to provide for kids. Um, we have our comprehensive guidance plan that has been developed, and um, Dr. Meyer. Working on that together, um, and that will be presented at the board meeting on the 25th. So, coming up with that. Um, as far as technology goes, um, our um, instructional technology plan has been worked on, um, and the, the draft is being reviewed. Um, but we have uh, the update on the smart boards. Most of them are installed, so 36 of them have been installed. Um, Dr. Soto and I um, talked about the draft that we do have in the budget for the coming year. Um, but we, we, he sent out an email to staff as a reminder. Um, you know, we do, we have seen some things in the news about um, cybersecurity, so we did send a reminder out to, um, and in light of things happening throughout the world, um, we did send a reminder out to staff to be very vigilant, vigilant excuse me, about um, looking at um, maintaining safe um, behaviors on our, on our technology. Um, and the next thing for them is May 5th. So that's what I got from today. Okay. Any questions about tonight's agenda? Okay. Uh, board of Ed is asked to accept the minutes of the following meetings as prepared by the district clerk. Minutes of the meeting of the Board of Ed on 3 9 22. Minutes of the meeting budget workshop of the Board of Ed on March 23rd, 2022. Minutes of the meeting budget workshop. Board of Education on April 6, 2022. Motion. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Yes. yes. Motion carries. Yes. 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 Finance reports. Um, be result of education upon the recommendation of the superintendent to the schools accept the following finance reports. A internal plan and audit report from March 2022. B, Treasurer's Report, February 2022, February, March 2022, and Budget Census 2B. Motion. Motion. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Budget Adoption 2022-2023. Recommended action that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education adopts the 2022-2023 proposed in the amount of forty-seven million five hundred seventy-six thousand four hundred dollars. Motion. Motion. Second. Second. Discussion. So I know. Uh, I know Danielle and Bobby got here a little bit. Okay. That's okay. It's okay. But we just want to make sure that we know you've seen the presentation uh, prior to to it tonight. You've been, you've been involved every step of the way. So we just want to make sure if you have any questions before we need to adopt it. Any discussion points? Okay, you good? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Tom? Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Yes. yes. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you again uh, for the time this work from the cabin, building uh, level admins, and everybody who contributed to the final budget. So, the final budget, I should say. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you. Property tax report card. Be resolved upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools to board the education hereby approves the 2022-2023 property tax report as presented to the board. At this meeting, be it further resolved that the assistant superintendent of business is directed to submit the property tax report card to the state education department by the end of the next business day following this approval. Motion moved. Second. Second. Discussion. All in favor? Yes. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Consent agenda approval. Be resolved. A motion to approve the consent agenda items A through 13. 
Motion. Motion. Second. Discussion. I know we have some uh, retirees in this section. Yeah, we are we are uh, accepting um, some retirements of note. Um, and so I will start with um, somebody who um, comes to us from Tennessee originally. Um, and I say that because, you know, I always knew there was something um, special about it, but I kind of like couldn't place it quite. And, and we talked about it, but we were getting into history a little bit. And it was like, you can't pay for the Carolinas. Really um, and Ms. Nancy Boyd, um, she actually, believe it or not, she is working as an office assistant right now. But she also was a paraprofessional for us. Um, and she was power of the year in 2018. And if you know her, and you know her as a, as a lady, she really comes across with that Southern um, And that's something that I think stands out about Nancy. Um, she's kind of like a Southern vet of the office there. And um, and it's just really just a delight to see at all times. And so I am certain this is probably the only time the power of the year that that was well deserved. Um, and the interesting thing about looking into her file, she is actually a certified teacher out of um, one of the universities in Tennessee, um, and came to us. So it comes to us with a lot of knowledge. And so, um, so when she got hired, um, that you know, not ten years ago, she was hired as a sub para and worked per diem, um, but does, like I said, hold a master's degree in teaching. So no surprise that she was such a gem for us, um, and has been exceptional in the office as well. Um, so we sorely miss, um, and we'll miss that southern charm um, in the high school office. Uh, we also have Miss Susan Lang, who is a uh, DCT teacher in our seventh grade, um, and she is really a lovely figure in the um, in the school. I can say I know for certain that that her retirement is a remarkable retirement. She would really love to be doing this forever, um, and so um, she began with us as a tutor in, in back in two thousand one, um, and so has been with us for um, over twenty years connected to the district. Um, we came full time in 2003, and um, Susan is really, like I said, that lovely figure to the kids and really has a great deal of affection for the students um, in the middle school. The students are in charge, um, so we'll be sort of like this as a special education team in our district. Um, lastly, we have Glenn Peppy. And um, Glenn, you know, when you look into his his background, I mean, you know, we kind of dug in a little bit. Um, Glenn also, not only is he, you know, a, a counselor, it's sort of there in the middle school. And, is responsible for the master schedule and, and all those wonderful things that he supports for our children in those years, which are such impressionable years. And to have a role model like Glenn is just exceptional for them. Um, so that, that's one part of them that's going to be um, really difficult to replace. But the other part of them that has been a um, He had actually taught classes on, um, on on athletic training at universities. So I, I think that if, if Glenn had a passion of working in guidance, I think athletic training certainly is something um, that he loves and, and I'm sure probably pursue moving on. Um, but certainly something that has been exceptional for us in the middle school and will be absolutely greatly missed and very hard, hard to replace uh, for the students in the department. So, um, and that's Glenn Peppy. Um, so we wish um, Nancy, Glenn, and Susan tremendous luck in retirement and wish them all good things in the department. Yeah, I was here when I was here. And, and, and he really had me helping out this program and he brought in the district. And it was, um, it was just an awesome program. Like, we have lots of memory people still talk to people about it. One day he pulled out pictures of us that he had in his, in his office. But that was just a, really one of those programs that you go to school. And, it's all the extra things that we do in this district that really, you know, so they stand out. For me, it was athletes up and athletes. We went to the Mets, um, we got one of our Wilson with him. We had a little bit of Shea Stadium when we went. It was really just an awesome program that he brought out to us for all of us. So I really appreciate that. Awesome. Always tough to lose good people. We certainly were still on this chapter. Yeah, I'm going to go back to
for many years and one of the best for the students who work throughout those years. Her retirement plan was to move to Pennsylvania and she and her family came back home. Unfortunately, that's all that she lost her back with COVID and this affected the powers of the family. The paraprofessionals left the tree and placed a plaque with her in her mind in the high school board. And so they're, they're doing this. Um, obviously, you know, these are the things that hit home when we reflect on the past couple of years and battling with COVID. We know we lost a couple of people in our school community. The um, one that really left us um, clearly um, was impacted that we like COVID and lost her life. Um, so we're asking you know, the board to just, well, what I said, to accept this donation. We will be declaring um, that tree in her memory. Very nice, Memorial. Do we know where it's going to be collected? Um, this is for the courtyard. Yeah. Very, very nice. Uh, general public comment. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion. What do you vote? So we're going to adjourn first of all. What do I get? So I get to everything. We're going to go to exemption. Uh, when we come out, we're not taking any action. So, uh, motion to move to executive session. Purpose of this.